Okay. So today we're moving on to a new topic, but not leaving virtue behind or, or generosity behind, not leaving it behind. How's the volume out there? Hey, okay. Okay. Yeah, so we're um, moving on to the next parami, um, which is virtue. It's the second one. And um, there's so many core aspects of traditional Buddhist practice, fundamental Buddhist aspects of traditional Buddhist practice that we have tended to overlook as, as these practices have come to the West. Hmm? One of them are the paramis themselves. I didn't hear about the paramis the first 20, 20, 30 years of my own meditation practice. Oh, there are paramis. There are these other qualities of, uh, uh, to be cultivated, you know? Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know that right at the get-go at the get -go in the East about the Paramis. And one that you know about immediately because it's considered to be even prior to meditation is uh, virtue or morality or ethical conduct. And in those days, I don't know, maybe it was a combination because we've all had our own relationships and resistances and whatever our orientation was to commandments. That, oh, I don't want anything to do with that in meditation practice. I think there was a, a pendulum swing away from wanting to take virtue too seriously. Or for myself and others I know, we thought, never mind, let's just practice mindfulness diligently. And almost magically, everything else will kind of fall into place all by itself. Now, that may sound silly, you know, a little naive. And frankly, when I say it and when I think about it now, it does sound a little naive. Uh, yeah, but I kind of thought that. And it was more like, no, I want the wisdom practices. That's all I want. I don't want any of the run, any of the prelim. I don't need preliminary practices of any kind. I don't need the compassion practices. I don't need the morality practices. I don't, just let me start be mindful. That was, and that is a largely, not entirely, but largely how it came over with the wisdom front and center practices, you know? And let's not attend to some of these other bits. But virtue, and, and for those of us who have been practicing for a while, uh, it's almost like we've backed, backed into them to, to reappreciate or appreciate more fully. Oh, that's why it's such a big part of the practice. Oh, right. That's a whole area of refinement and attunement that's so important. And in in, in, as we start to think of this as a whole life practice, rather than just this thing that we're parsing out and doing on the cushion in a particular way, you know? So uh, virtue and the virtue or, or sila or ethical conduct, the, the, the basis of that, or the, the, the overarching principle of it is non-harm, you know, non-harm to self, non-harm to other. And that rests on the assumption that whether, whether we're aware of it in every moment or not, we are intimately, inextricably interconnected all the time with other beings and with all life. Now, we are not separate. It is the illusion of separateness that causes us so much, so much of our suffering, but we are connected. We are sentient beings. We are sensitive beings. 
with mirror neurons. Hmm? We are social beings. We are affected by others and others are affected by us. Yeah, yeah. And it's simply honoring that, that core truth of our existence and manif manifesting it in body, speech, and mind. <clears throat> and taking that really rather seriously as a part of daily life practice, it's a part of life practice, as well as on the cushion. Yeah? Uh, it's taking it seriously. It's taking it seriously. And it's taking it seriously, you know, there's a there's a fun, that middle ground between giving ourselves a hard time because we're not good enough or pure enough and being overly complacent on the other end of the extreme. Like, oh, well, I'm a good enough person. I don't really need to practice sila more than this. You know, I don't do anything. You know, I read the newspapers. I'm not I'm not any of those people. Maybe that's just good enough. You know, I've done a little bit of that too. You know, we can all do a little of that. No, come on. I, yeah, I'm not doing any great damage. My intentions are basically good. You know? Yeah, yeah, right. But all of these practices, <clears throat> all of these practices are wherever we are, wherever we start from, it's bringing more refinement, right? It's bringing more refinement to what it is that we're up to, to, to cause and effect as, as well, to just being honest. The precept behind the precept is, um, let's, let's oh, we don't have to call it a precept, but the, the commitment behind all of this is, let's just take a closer look. And so we're gonna ask you to be doing it this month. Let's take a closer look at this area of virtue and this area of virtue and this area of virtue, you know? And very and very simple, you know how we are. We'll give you, give you some very simple handholds and suggestions. Well, let's pay attention more to this this week and how that is, how that is for us, you know? Let's, let's, how are we doing with that? What do we learn when we turn toward uh, these, some of these areas more, uh, more, more consistently? As if, as if they do matter as if they do matter, as if they really are part of our Dharma practice, part of our practice. And one more thing, which is, it's clear to me now, it's clearer to, clearer to me now than it used to be. When we do something unskillful, even a little bit unskillful, I used to think I was could just kind of get away with it. Like, well, all right, that was no big deal. <laughs> There may not be big deals, but there are a lot of li little deals. And when we do something unskillful, it does leave a residue in the psyche and in the body. It does. It has an impact. We say something unskillful. We say something rough. I mean, we'll go through all these, some of these, but it, it does matter. It has an impact. And traditionally, it's said, you're going to have a hard time developing concentration if you haven't incorporated some you know a fair amount of virtue in your in, in your life you'll sit down there'll be regret i wish i'd done this i wish i'd said that i wish i can't believe i did that it, it, all the ripples and ruffles of um uh places where we weren't so skillful will also show up directly to us in our meditation practice so for all of the above reasons uh, we think it's super important to to go through these, and uh, fortunately, we'll have a whole month to go to eat, with through each one of these um, uh, paramis. But this month will be um, will, will be virtue. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, no, you want to mention what they are. Mention what they are. Yeah. The, the main the main categories. Yeah. So you're saying. Um, it's ethical conduct in body, speech, and mind. And it is not based upon uh, external structures like a religion telling us what to do or the law telling us what's right or wrong. It's an internal rudder. We are, we are training and training the heart to be able to feel what is skillful and what is unskillful. 
and to move in the direction of more skillfulness. That's what we're doing. And the, the Buddha gave uh, guidelines for us to use. And, and I, I, I do like to think of them as guidelines. And we will use these guidelines on and off the cushion. And for lay folk, there are five, only five that, that we have to remember. Um, uh, and we, again, we'll go through them. But, but I'm going to say them, uh, say what they are. First is uh, refraining from taking life. That means not slapping the insect if we can, or, or noticing if we need to. Can we just push it off our skin so we don't hurt that other being? Because that other being wishes to live as well, right? And the, the, the flip side of that is we are offering safety. We're offering the virtue, the gift, the gift. Think of generosity now, the gift of safety. The second one is um, refrain from not taking that which isn't given. We could say stealing, but I think taking that which isn't given. So, you know, somebody, somebody leaves a scarf on a chair and it's there for a couple hours and we think, oh, it's long gone. Oh, I like that scarf. So I, I, I'll just take it, right? Finders keepers. It's not that in the practice. It's like noticing the impulse to do that and gently refraining from that because that isn't ours. It isn't ours. It wasn't offered to us. And on the flip side, and that is an offering of the heart of trust. We're offering trust to other people that we're not gonna take other people's belongings. The third, refraining from sexual misconduct or misuse of bodily senses of sensual pleasure. And we understand that, right? We understand, you know, that um, people engage in all kinds of, like there may be some flirtation. Let's say you're, you're in a partnership, but oh, this other person over here looks a, kind of a little enticing and there's a little flirtiness going on. Are we aware of that little flirtiness? Are we aware of that? And, and is learning how to refrain from that. And we can like someone or appreciate someone, but we don't have to necessarily lean in the direction of mm, being, being a little in the gray zone of skillfulness. The flip side is the offering of respect. The offering of the gift of respect. Beautiful, beautiful offering. The fourth is refraining from wrong speech. And we'll talk more about this. We'll have, we'll have a whole, probably a whole week on that because that can be broken out. Um, there are several ways in which we can go astray with wrong speech and we, we all fall into this. None of us have arrived. <clears throat> so the flip side of wrong speech, the offering the gift of honesty and integrity honesty and integrity, speaking truth, speaking from the heart, speaking from what is needed, what is useful. And the fifth is refraining from the use of intoxicants. And let's say um, the indulgence of intoxicants. Now, why would that be so? Well, because it leads to heedlessness. It leads to carelessness. We're not as sharp. Our mind is not as sharp when we've had a glass of wine, two glasses of wine. It grows more dull with each successive glass. So we recognize the dangers of that. The flip side of that is offering the gift of clarity, clarity of mind, clarity to be able to see clearly what is needed in this moment, which is again, the thing we lose with intoxicants. So these are the, the gen, this is the general territory and these are the guidelines that the Buddha offered to laity as a way of living harmoniously, internally and externally. All right. And we take these with us wherever we go and we take them with us on the cushion 
and off the cushion. And so we'll explore them on the cushion as well. For example, uh, just notice the way you speak to yourself in the privacy of your mind on the cushion and see if you might find a way to be a little kinder, a little gentler with how you speak to yourself, okay? All right, this is a little overview. <laughs> For those of you who are doing post-it notes, again, I encourage that, you know, play around with, you might uh, put, put it, it's like a post-it note such as, what is skillful here? What is skillful right now? How might you be skillful in this moment? Do you open up the cabinet door or you're doing the dishes and you have that in front of you? How might you be skillful right there? Slow it down, pay attention, notice what you're doing. Oh, right. The gift of being fully present, knowing what I'm doing and perhaps even enjoying what I'm doing a little bit more. Right? We're, this trains the heart to be unencumbered by the burdens of, of unskillfulness. So let's train our hearts that way. All right. And I'm going to pass this back to Bill and he's going to guide us today. Yes, obviously we'll be spending time on each of these in some uh, and with some more nuance throughout the month, yeah, and um, and in our meditation practice, uh, as we start to open up here and start to open up, right, as we as you may, uh, just as last month we encouraged bringing generosity of spirit into your meditation practice and feeling into that. Uh, Well, part of it will be, as Susan just suggested, <clears throat> we'll go into this more when we talk about right speech, but how is your, the how is the right, what, what is right inner speech? Hmm? How are you talking to yourself when you're meditating? Hmm? Yeah. And so when you're ready, lightly closing the eyes. I'm moving the attention, oh, certainly to some extent away from the, the thinking mind and down into the body and the breath, the breath. And orienting toward a comfortable breath. A breath with space and ease.
space and ease and kindness orienting in those directions.
And when mind gets lost in some kind of cognitive drift, you notice that simply uh, coming back to the next exhale and releasing, finding yourself here with another easeful, comfortable breath.
settling back, <clears throat> settling back a bit more, allowing the breath to come to you. Receptive attention.
stop the recording.